Four, four, come on. Four, four, four. Come on, come on, girl. Four, come on, come on. Four, four, four. Come on, hey, hey, come on. Four, 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 four. Come on, come on, girl. Hey, come on. Four, four, four. Come on. Four, four, come on. Four, four, four. Come on, come on. Hey, come on. Four, four, four. And you know, I wouldn't consider calling cattle any other way. I mean, it's like kitty, 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 you know, for a cat. That's yeah, just what we do. I'm Will Harris, and the name of my farm is White Oak Pastures. It's a grass-fed beef farm in Early County, Georgia. It's in southwest Georgia. That's Possum. Possum is my constant companion. He is with me uh, all the time when I'm on the farm. And uh, he's never been to the vet, uh, never been bathed. Uh, he may go on a walkabout and not show up for a couple of days, uh, but he, uh, uh, he, he's, he's my buddy. I grew up on this farm, and, and my father did, and his father did. My great-grandfather came here in 1866, and uh, he was a cattleman, and we've been raising cows here ever since. This is a closed herd. All these female cows were born on this farm. Their mothers were born on the farm. Grandmothers, great-grandmothers, great-great-grandmothers all the way back to 1866 when my great-grandfather come here. You know, I love my herd as much as you love your dog or cat. I like to raise them. I like to be with them. I like to work with them. Uh, I like to, to improve their life. Uh, I, like to, I like to see them out there doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, I insist that uh, the animals are treated with dignity and uh, respect, you know, every day of their life and the day they die. Because we've owned this land for almost a century and a half, it's important to me that I s take care of it. And I believe that the, the grass-based production system that we utilize, that we utilize here, is the absolute best case uh, for the stewardship of my land. Well, I was a very conventional cattleman for many years. I went to the University of Georgia, majored in animal science, and learned industrial beef production, and came home and did it. I used hormone implants on my cattle, uh, fed uh, antibiotics, sub-therapeutic antibiotics. Uh, confinement fed a high carbohydrate uh, corn and soy diet and used all the other tools that science had given us to make beef production uh, cheap and quick and efficient. But as I approached middle age, uh, the, the excesses of that production system came to, to bother me more and more. You know, the idea of loading uh, 100, 500 pound calves that I raised on a double-decker truck, the ones on top urinating and defecating on the ones on the bottom, and letting them be driven 30 hours without food or water or rest to Nebraska or Iowa or somewhere, just really didn't seem like what I ought to be doing. You know, calves that we had raised from birth to that point and then to, to just ship them away like that was not the way I wanted to make my living. And I guess about 1995, I started reading about sophisticated consumers that wanted to eat meat that was raised differently. About Six or eight years ago, I made the decision to quit using chemical fertilizers and pesticides on my pastures. And it was a really painful decision. I've never used cocaine, but using 
uh, particularly nitrogen-based fertilizers, I believe is like cocaine for farmers. Uh, you, know, you put it out and you just get this incredible lush growth that's just really wonderful. But then the downside is you become dependent upon it because it takes out the naturally living flora and fauna in the soil that we depended on from time of war to until post-World War II when this, these things became so cheap and available. And I was like, a, like an alcoholic. I'd say, I won't order any ammonium nitrate today. I'll make it through today without it. And that's still, you know, there are times I'd kill a man for a load of ammonium nitrate. You know, it's, it's just good stuff in the short run. But you know, it's, it's kind of like urinating in your pants to stay warm. It's a good short-term strategy, but long-term, it's really not the thing to do. The reoccurring thought was, if this is such a good idea, why isn't everybody else doing it? You know, I mean, I don't think I'm smarter than everybody else, so how come I'm doing this and they're not? Uh, I, I'm certainly not smarter than everybody else, but I probably am more passionate about the cattle business than most of the other people I know. You know, it's, it's not just my uh, livelihood, vocation and advocation, but it's also my heritage and my legacy. You know, you are what you eat, and I think that probably you are what you eat eats. Uh, Grass-fed beef production is a return to what I call the old way of producing beef. That is to say, calves are born here on my farm. Don't get anything except mother's milk, grass, and hay until they're finished. Uh, cattle are designed to eat grass. They evolved to eat grass. They were created to eat grass. That, that can be any verbiage you want it to be, but the fact is uh, cattle are ruminants. You know, you've always been told that cattle have four stomachs. Well, no, they have one stomach, but it has four sections. And the purpose of that is to, to, to turn this, this cellulose that wouldn't do you and I much good if we ate it into uh, protein and carbohydrate that they assimilate and turn into beef. Uh, it's the most natural thing, natural production system in the world for beef. What's artificial is to take these animals and confine them and feed them a high carbohydrate diet of corn and soy. These animals look a lot different from a feedlot animal. I don't know if you've ever seen a feedlot animal, but uh, these animals weigh about a thousand pounds and they, they walk everywhere they go. They're like athletes. A feedlot animal uh, will be much younger and it's an obese animal that would never occur in nature. Those feedlot animals stand in a confined area where they don't get exercise and they eat a very high carbohydrate diet of corn and soy. It's, it's the difference in taking two kids and turning one loose out there on the football field and feeding them a good high protein diet of, of, of meat and vegetables and another kid and chaining him to the couch and feeding him potato chips. You know, those, that's the two extremes we're talking about here. You know, my cattle are athletes. When they get up in the mornings, they'll go out and fill up that huge rumen they have with grass. Then in the middle of the day, they lie there and we call it chewing their cud. They regurgitate it back, chew it, swallow it, and it goes on back to another part of their stomach. This afternoon, when it gets cool, they'll do the process all over again. What leaves this farm is really high quality gourmet beef for people to enjoy. And what's beautiful about it is, it's made from sunshine and rainwater, and what those microscopic flora and fauna are generating in that good, healthy, organic soil makes good, sweet grass. The cows eat it, gain weight, and reproduce. And what can be more natural or more beautiful than that? And the answer is nothing. Nobody has ever owned this beef but me. We own the land and the cows 
We raise the calves. Our employees slaughter and process it in our processing plant. When I first went in the grass-fed beef business, uh, I relied on uh, local custom abattoirs to slaughter and process my cattle for me. It was clear that if we were going to continue in the grass-fed beef business, we had to do something different, and the something different you know, wound up being to build a $2.2 million USDA approved plant on this farm. We've got the only USDA approved on farm uh, beef plant east of the Mississippi. There's only one other one in the United States. It's in California. And we, uh, we actually, the calves that are born here in these pastures will ultimately be turned into beef here in these pastures or in our packing plant, which sits across that pasture there. We spend a minimum of three years raising a calf. And you process him in six hours, and you can screw up what you spent three years perfecting. And then when you get in the kitchen, if you're not careful, somebody in 30 minutes can screw up uh, at the end of that. So I can't help what happens in somebody's kitchen, but I needed co to control the processing segment of our, of our market. You know, I really, urge people, really beg people, please, you know, don't, don't overcook it. You know, try to eat it as rare as you can. Uh, rare's best, medium rare's almost that good. You know, and if you're gonna cook it well done, go to the discount store and get you something that costs a dollar a pound. It's arrogant for me to assume that people ought to just fall in there and stand in line and pay more for my beef if they hadn't been exp uh, explained and taught of why it's better. Uh, you know, my beef is just like industrial commodity beef, except I think it's safer and healthier, and better for the environment, better for the welfare of the animals, better for the integrity of a, a local food system, and tastes better. Except for those things, it's just like industrial commodity beef that you can buy at any discount store. I've always loved this farm, but the older I get, the stronger my sense of place becomes until I'm really not happy unless I'm here on this farm. And, and every morning I start my day with a big cup of coffee in my pastures, I like, I like being there when the sun comes up. And every evening, I end my day with a 750 milliliter glass of wine in my pastures, I like to be there when the sun goes down. And I really don't much care what I have to do between those two events, but it really ticks me off if I miss one of them. Now, I, you know, I try to end my days like this. You know, I, I like to end about 365 of them like this every year. In our society, our civilization, somebody's got to be the food producer. And in our civilization, the food producer historically has been the farmer. And where I think we went wrong is when we started looking to science for the answers to farming production problems and quit looking to nature. You know, what we do is uh, it's all art and, and very little science. You know, it went from being all science and no art to all art and very little science. Uh, the core values of my family have always been, you take care of the land and the herd and they'll take care of you. My family has been on this farm for 143 years. I have three daughters. I'd like for Harris's to be on this farm for another 143 years if they want to. And I believe that uh, having this vertically integrated system where I take sunshine and rainwater and well-balanced soil and turn it into beef and sell it to a sophisticated consumer that appreciates it is a better bet than being a component in a big industrial complex where I'm just providing calves.
You know, if you're going to be a cow, this is the place to be a cow. Me and Possum don't really know what we can do to make cows any happier than this. I mean, we, we talk about it a lot. We just don't know what we can do.